Hello, I'm Greg Pollock, and you're watching the eighth episode of the Scaling Rails screencast series, supported by New Relic. Did you know with New Relic RPN, you can set alerts to warn you about performance problems and errors on your Rails app? You can even monitor your app from wherever you are on your iPhone. In this episode, we're going to be looking at Memcached. And that is right, that's how it's pronounced. Memcached evolved out of the LiveJournal community. LiveJournal, in case you're not familiar with it, is a community where say, anybody can sign up for a blog and then you know connect to your friends and read your friends' blogs on LiveJournal. So here's somebody's blog on LiveJournal. Looks pretty simplistic, and you could probably page cache this thing, but it starts to get more complicated when you look at some of these links up here. There's a link here we're going to click called Friends. What this page is showing is all of this guy's friends most recent blog posts. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. So, you know, this guy has other dog friends, as you can see here, and these are the most recent posts that his, you know, dog friends have posted on LiveJournal. Seems pretty simplistic, but it gets much more complex as you take a deeper look. Let's take a moment to think about what's going on under the hood of this web page. So we get the guy's user info, we look up all of his friends, and then we go and we find the most recent posts from all of his friends, and that's what's rendered on the page. So when you think about it, let's see, we could probably just page cache all of these pages. There would be 17.5 million friends pages because there's 17.5 million users on LiveJournal. That's a lot, but it's still doable, and page caching scales very well. Unfortunately, things get much more complex when you realize what they're doing on this page is they're also checking the security level of each post. See, when you post something on LiveJournal, you can specify, is it open to the public? Only certain users can see it? Only certain groups maybe can see your post? So every time we load up this guy's page, even this guy's friend's page, it needs to check to see if we're authorized to see each one of the posts on those pages. So really, if you wanted to do page caching, you'd have to create 17.5 million versions of 17.5 million friends pages, which would be very obnoxious because every person who looks at it might have a different view of it. So we obviously can't use page caching, we can't use action caching, we can't use fragment caching, so what are we left with? Well, what we might do is simply cache the array of the most recent posts from these friends um, in memcached. So, what would the pseudocode for that look like? We might have a function called getFriendsPost, which goes and gets all of the most recent friends post, stores that in some cache somewhere, returns that. This would be for the first request. And the second time somebody comes along, it's going to check to see if we already pulled that array from the database. If we have, well then just return that. And so we've avoided having to go into the database, do lots of joins across many tables, and we've got this array of all the most recent posts that we can use in our, to render our page. So what exactly is memcached? Well, here's the long explanation. And here's the short explanation. Right? It's basically just a hash in memory. So in order to configure memcached with Rails, all we need to know is this one line of code. This is probably something you put in your production.rb in your config directory. And we can use it in two different ways. We can use it as an object store, just like LiveJournal. Or we can use it as a fragment and cache store for our action and fragment caching. We'll take a look at that in a minute. Installing memcached is actually quite easy. If you're on a Mac, you can just install Darwin ports and then do a sudo port install memcached. Or if you're on Windows, you know there's some binaries you can install off of the memcached website. It's also worth mentioning that memcached runs as a separate process from your Rails instance. Right? The benefit of this is that you can have several Rails instances that all reference the same memcached instance, right? So they're all going to be using a shared cache. Now let's go back to our Rails application and configure it to use memcached and see how easy that is. First thing we're going to do is go into our configuration file. We're going to make sure we've got perform caching equal to true. And then we're going to add one line of configuration to tell it that we want to use memcached as our cache store. I could also put, you know, a port here or a different host if it, I was using, running this on a different server. So now we're going to start up memcached, and then we're going to start up our Rails server. Now, if we go back to the posts index page in our browser, do a refresh. That's it. Now we're using memcached. 
If we take a look back in our console, go over to the memcached process, we can actually see the keys that are getting stored inside of memcached. So there's our recent posts key up there. And if we do another refresh on our browser, we can see that it actually pulled the fragment out of memcached and loaded that onto our page. So that's how we use memcached as a fragment store, but in order to use memcached as an object store, we need to use these commands you see here. Let's go ahead and run some of those commands so we can get a little more familiar with them. So down here I'm starting up the Rails console. Up there I've got memcached running. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to read out that fragment cache that we just stored in there a second ago. So here you can see the, uh, the HTML that got stored in there. Now you can just write about anything you want to memcached. We're going to start out with a simple string. So we're giving it the key name and then the value, which is Greg. We can read that key back out of memcached. We can check to see if it exists. We can delete it. And then if we go to read it out, after we deleted it, it simply returns nil because it doesn't exist anymore. Let's go ahead and try storing an active record object in memcached. Right, so we're going to get the first post. What's happening here is when it goes to store memcached, it's actually um, serializing the object and then deserializing it, going back and forth. So here we've got to get it back out of memcached, and we can see it's an active record object still. There's another command that's really convenient called fetch. What we do with fetch is we give it a key and then we give it a block. And whatever that last value of that block is, is what gets stored as the value. But the thing is, if we call that twice, as you see I did here, the second time we call it, well, it checks to see if last post exists. It does exist, so it doesn't run that code block. It just returns the value. So now I'm going to show you guys a new option with memcached called the expires in option. So I actually can tell it that I want this time key to expire in five seconds. So as I can see, I just got the time, right? And so it looks like it's still within five seconds, still within five seconds, it stayed the same. And then down here, it finally expired. And so it recached the time. So as I mentioned before with our previous screencast, that memcache seriously saves the day when it comes to cache expiration. Because if you code in a certain way, you never have to do it. The first way we can avoid cache expiration with memcache D is by using this expires at option, which I showed you guys a second ago. So what might that look like? Well, in our post model, we might want to pull the most recent posts, but we only care about them being updated every 30 minutes. So we can simply say expires in 30 minutes, and this is only going to be running one query every 30 minutes instead of every time somebody hits that page. We can also use this in views if you want to. So we could say recent post expires in 30 minutes and it would only render every 30 minutes. Of course, you wouldn't want to use these together. You'd probably keep them separate. The second way we can avoid cache expiration with memcached is by using intelligent keys. But before I show you how to do that, we need to have a deeper understanding of how memcached works under the covers. So if I started up with this line of code here on the command line, what that's going to do is allocate two gigs of memory for my memcached instance. That's going to get more full and more full as I do more caching with my website. But what's going to happen when I push something onto the stack while it's full? It turns out memcached is smart enough that when you push something onto the stack while it's full, it simply looks at the oldest item, what's something that I haven't used in a very long time, and it's simply going to push that off the stack or pop it off the stack. What that means is we can push data into memcached that we never plan to expire. So here's our little fragment cache helper here. And so if you've got lots of data about a post, what would we name this cache? It might be post ID data. Um, but what would happen if we added updated at? The updated at date stamp in there as well. So the key would look something like this. Now if we go and we update that post somewhere, well that means the key is going to change. right? So the next time this page gets run, it's going to regenerate that cache. That old cache up here is simply going to wait till expire because nobody's going to use it anymore. And we don't have to worry about doing any cache expiration. So the cache helper we have up here is going to generate a cache key that looks like this. 
But it turns out Rails actually has a convention built in for generating these types of intelligent cache keys. If I simply send in the post active record object, by default, it's going to generate a cache key which looks like this, which already has the date stamp in it. What exactly is going on under the hood? Well, it's calling the cache key method on the post active record object, which simply does this, right? It takes the model name, makes it friendly, adds the ID, adds the updated app. Right? So everything we really need to create that intelligent cache key. The same thing goes for those four fragment cache methods we saw earlier. So if we send in the post object, it's going to call a cache key on them and create the same key that we created with the other one there. But what do we do if we have an HTML snippet that shows us lots of data about both a post and a user object? So if any of those objects get updated, well, we need to regenerate the HTML in there. Well, it turns out we can simply do an array of both the post and the user object, and Rails will intelligently generate a key, which this is basically, it looks like it called cache key on both of those objects, and combine that into one long key that we can use. If you had something like this in your code, you'd probably also want to add an additional string to that cache key to signify that, well, we're talking about a sidebar. So that might look something like this, where you put a string at the end of that array, which would generate a cache key that looks something like that. I decided to go looking for a place where we might use this cache expiration on the Flickr website. What I found was, on the bottom right-hand side of the page, there's this little box here that gives us information about the photo. Right? So this is stuff that's probably only going to get updated if you know the author goes in and updates the image. So what we could do here is we could put a block in here which looks something like this. So now if the photo gets updated, well, this fragment will get regenerated. To take a look at a more advanced example, I decided to go over and look at the comments part of the photo page. How might we deal with caching this and not have to expire it. We might create a cache key that's made up of the photo and the photo version. This version just being an integer, which would create a cache key to look something like this. Now you might be wondering, what is this version object and what does it have to do with comments? Well, we might have something like this in our comment model. So that after we save a comment, or after we destroy a comment, it's going to increment the version in the photo that that comment belongs to, which invalidates the cache, and then, well, that little fragment cache is going to get regenerated next time somebody sees the page. So now that you know how to use Memcached in your Rails application, let's make sure it's clear when you want to use it. So you want to use memcached when you're doing any type of action or fragment caching. Memcached is probably the most powerful cache store, and that's what all the big websites are using to scale, so you might as well just go ahead and use it. Um, you also want to use it when you're in a scenario like LiveJournal, right, where you want to store a bunch of active record objects, maybe a array you pull out of the database. You want to have to avoid doing lots of database hits, so you take all of those active record queries, store them in memcached, so that the next request doesn't have to continuously hit the database. It can really lighten your database load. Well, that's all I got for this episode on memcached. Coming up next, we're going to be talking about client-side caching with stuff like max age, e-tags, and last modified. So stay tuned for that, and thanks for watching.